so just about Sheldon Nolley, just some background. It was founded in 2006 as like an actual company. Um, and it's in Timonium, Maryland, which is like really close. They produce about 5,000 pounds of granola each week. Oh, wow. And they have about five different types of granola. And then they distribute to um, about 200 different markets and grocery stores. And those range from like, as like they go as far as like Ohio and as like north as like, as like New York or Pennsylvania. So it's like, it's like east coast, but it's like, it can go, it goes pretty far. So the reason I chose this is because they do a lot of good things for like the environment. So they, all their delivery trucks run on biodiesel or like recycled vegetable oil. The, the big factory where they produce their granola is 100% wind powered. The, product, the stuff that goes into their granola, about 70% 70 of it is organic. And they try to, as much as they can, they try to use local ingredients from Maryland and Pennsylvania to go into the, because there's a lot of ingredients in the different granolas. So they try to make it as local as possible. And sorry, just for everyone's benefit, what's the what's the plus side or the advantage of buying locally? I'll get to it. Okay. Oh, okay. So I'm like getting to all of these things. So just some quick things about biodiesel. Um, so you, it comes from like, extra, like extracting different oils from like algae and other plants, and it's commonly used like corn is a major one. So it can be it's, it should be. Biodiesel is able to just completely be put into a diesel car, so there's nothing, no like refining that needs to go into it. So it can be either 100% biodiesel that goes into a car, or it can the co more common one is 20% biodiesel and 80% petroleum, which is what is offered at the um, biodiesel fueling stations. So again, it's, you can use it in like, any diesel engine, and you can even make your own biodiesel at home from like waste oil produced by local restaurants. And so these little um, charts are just showing you um, how that biodiesel produces significantly less CO2 emissions than like regular gasoline or like other diesel. And then um, showing that this like still gets like a lot of energy out of it, even though it's sort of not as common as regular like petroleum that you would use in a car. And so just the, um, some of the more environmental benefits so B100, which is the 100% biodiesel, it eliminates all sulfur emissions, which adds to like acid rain, other air pollutants. Um, it cut, no emissions of carbon monoxide and particulate matter would, uh, is, uh, is cut in half, which is another um, air pollutant. <laughs> and then it reduces the emissions of carbon dioxide by more than 75%, which is uh, the significant contributor to as a greenhouse gas. And then even using B12, which is the 20% bio, biodiesel, it reduces carbon dioxide emissions by 15%, which is just still a huge step. Um, and the process to actually make biodiesel produces less emissions than producing just regular diesel. So that's, again, a huge step. And then we talk about this in, in environmental science, but like, it's also like modern carbon, which means that it's like recently been in the atmosphere. And so, because it's like found in plants and stuff, so it's like not the coal that was buried underground for millions of years. So it can be considered carbon neutral because you're like taking in as much carbon as much as you're as you're producing. So it just comes it just comes full circle. And then just to briefly talk about recycled vegetable oil, which is very similar. So it's another alternative fuel, but the car must be modified to actually run on recycled vegetable oil, and it comes from. Um, there's like frying oils produced by like local restaurants and bars. Like you can, this is a advertisement I think from San Diego that's saying we will pay you to take your waste away that we will use in our cars. So it's like it's a, become a really both of these things are becoming really common in a lot of areas, especially in like the Midwest because they have a lot of corn and different um, like vegetables. So this, if it works is a YouTube video about, um, it's like a college group that is working on, it's just them making their own biodiesel. And so it looks like it's working. Oh, you need to. Nope. Is this the volume? Is this the volume? Okay. 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 Doing that by taking corn.
corn stover, which is corn harvest residue. It's not the corn kernels or any of the edible part of the corn, but the cob and the stalk and the leaves. And we put that in this machine right here, and it gets ground up into really fine pieces. We have a sample of it. It's basically almost a powder form. It pulverizes it. And that goes down into an auger. And the auger is basically a big screw, and it moves the material up to the pelletizer. And the barrel that you see here holds animal and human waste. And that gets incorporated into the auger with the corn stover. And that the waste acts as a binder, and it also helps reduce pathogens that are harmful to people in the environment. And so that goes down into the pelletizer and it pelletizes it into small pellets that are about an eighth of an inch in diameter. And we also have a sample of the pellets right here. With the next year's grant, we'll be able to design and manufacture a gasifier. And the gasifier will burn the pellets and generate hydrogen gas, which will drive an internal combustion engine and generate electricity for families, farms, and homes in Katali, Kenya. So that video just sort of shows that like it is very easy to actually make your own like bio like biofuels of any kind and like those were using the waste parts of corn so it's like you can use corn for both eating and then use the extras to actually like fuel your own car. So I'm going to talk about wind power now. So like as I said, Michelle's granola factory is 100% wind powered. So right now, about two to three percent of the total electricity in the United States is powered by wind, which is about nine million homes. And with all the um, wind power, like the farms that are there now and the farms that are planning to be made, um, at about 2030, they predict that 20% of our electricity will come from wind. So the biggest producers are sort of like very flat states. So that's like Texas, California, Iowa, Illinois, and Oregon. So they're places with like very little mountains to like keep wind from like slowing down. So with the amount of wind that is in the United States, we have the ability to produce 10 times the existing electricity needs. Like, if we had all the wind turbines that we could have, we would be very well off and we wouldn't need any other sort of electricity generation. So, building a wind turbine has a very short payback time, so it's about eight and a half months, which means that, like, with the money you have to go into, like, building it and, like, maintaining it, it'll only take eight and, eight, eight and a half months until you like, basically get all that money back because you save that much from using wind power. And because wind power is obviously very renew, like, renewable and it like, doesn't stop, um, it keeps electric rates really low because there's no competition between like, whether petroleum or like, coal is available. So some more like, benefits to wind power. It's like clean, affordable, domestic, and infinite. So it's as I said, it's like renewable, so like wind just like it doesn't just stop, like it's gonna keep being windy. Um, there's uh, obviously it produces no emissions because it's just um, like wind turning turbines and then just like the electricity being generated. Um, it doesn't require any outside resources, so like in nuclear power plants, you need a lot of water, in fracking, you need a lot of water, and there's no other like minerals that go into producing wind power. And if you've ever seen a wind turbine, you know that it, like it uses very little land because it's just like. It's just like a big circle and then it just like goes up. And wind um, and wind turbines are often on farmland. So it's like actually using, it's like it's not just like in, it's not taking up a lot of space and it's on places that are already have a lot of space. And so just to quickly talk about wind turbines. So they're about 200 feet tall. And then each of their, um, the like fans are like 130 feet. So the way that wind turbines work is that when, um, wind blows it will turn the um like the, the the fans and there's a weather vane on the back of it that makes sure that the um turbine is turning in the best direction for the weather so the turbines turn about like eight revolutions per like 18 revolutions per minute which is like very slow but they connect to gears inside of it that turn at 1800 revolutions per minute which can which is attached to a generator and then generates like a ton of electricity so that's sort of a quick overview of how wind turbines actually work. And so they said that they like, try to buy local as often as possible. So like these are the benefits of buying local. So like, buying local te like, 
the definition is sort of like vague. Like it's usually like food that's produced within a hundred miles of your home or in your state, but I think that sort of like varies between different states because like Maryland would be very different than California. But today, the average food travels between 1,500 and 3,000 miles from farm to table. So that's a lot of the food that's like produced in Mexico because not, you can't have like avocados growing in Maryland, stuff like that. So the like, benefits of buying local is that there is little transport between the, the farmer and the consumer. <coughs> so that like, much less carbon dioxide will be emitted from their, like, from their trucks and cars and also minimal, minimal packaging is used because usually they pick the like the vegetables like the day before and then just like brought it in like a bag to the farmer's market. So it's like not being wasteful. So it's not just having like extra plastic and like cardboard or whatever. And buying local is really often um, like really correlated with sustainable and organic farming. So the benefits of buying like organic food, there's a lot of them. So like one of them is like it's monocultures are really bad for the soil. So that's sort of what you see in this picture. It's what you think of like the typical like corn farm in like in the Midwest, just when it's just like corn for miles and miles. And it takes a, rips a lot of the nutrients out of the soil. And it, that's what like leads to having to add like pesticides and fertilizers. Like with organic, people do like crop rotations and like intercropping. So that's like using different vegetables and plants on the same gland but like adding nutrients back so they're not all using the same stuff and so fertilizers and pesticides are they're both like harmful for the environment because they they can both run off into like groundwater or into streams and really harm the like the water aquatic life and they can also like pesticides can kill animals and like plants that are that it isn't targeted to use um so or, organic farms will also use like less water because they're not just go because it's like easier for someone to work on a smaller amount of land which is typically what is used for organic farming so it's not just like spraying water over like miles and miles of corn it's like going like <laughs> sort of in more individually to each like plot of land and also like buying organic like promote biodiversity because it won't be that one like crop that's grown on that one like piece of land it's like 10 different crops grown on like a smaller piece of land and they're both they're all like all 10 are like, able to thrive so going just to back to michelle's granola it's like places to buy it and to like support this company you can easily get it at eddie's right there like at whole foods and if you are more interested in like buying organic and local like the waverly farmers market which is every saturday because they have a lot of different like local places for like fruits and vegetables and then you can also go online and order it there. So that's it. Questions for Nora? Comments? Do you know where um, biodiesel um, stations are? Or if they are in the Maryland? I want to say, I, look, I saw this and there wasn't that much information on it but I think that there are more they're more in like the Midwest where like biodiesel is a lot more used because you don't see a lot of people actually using biodiesel in Maryland so I don't think there are I, at least I didn't like, hear of any here maybe in like the more rural parts of Maryland but I think there are more like in the Midwest